This masterclass series has been produced by Deliberately Engaging in support of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals to build the institutions of civil society and empower people with a greater voice. Hello and welcome to this podcast. I'm Ed Davis and I'm the moderator for this masterclass series for activists on the union movement's history of struggle and achievements. The series draws on the wisdom and experience of Tom McDonald, former vice president of the ACTU and former national secretary of the Building Workers Industrial Union. Today, we're very pleased to have three guests with us, Michelle O'Neill, ACTU president, Michael Kane, National Secretary of the Transport Workers' Union, and Nadine Flood, National Secretary of the Community and Public Sector Union from 2009 to mid last year. In previous episodes, we've looked at values and strategy. A few points about strategy. Strategy comes into play when values and interests collide. It's required when others oppose the change you're seeking to make. And it's been described as the art of creating power. This podcast discusses power, what it is, why it's important to analyze and understand it, and how to build it. I want to start by asking the panel, what do unions need to do to enable working people to influence decisions that affect their lives and make Australia a fairer society? What is it that unions need to do? Michelle, can I can I start with you? Over to you. Ed, uh, thanks for that. And of course, what we need to do is organise. I mean, the the most fundamental thing that affects working people's power is our capacity to organise collectively. And so, to be able to change the country we've got and the position that working class people and workers have in it, then there's nothing more important than finding ways to grow the union movement and to reach workers with the understanding and the story about why collective power is something that can ultimately change their lives. So this is the, the fundamental, the need to organise workers and need to organise workers in the changing world of work. So we no longer have the same labour market, we no longer have the same workplaces, even well before the pandemic, of course, what we know is that there's so many different modes that employers now use to try and distance themselves from the worker and the responsibility for those workers' pay and condition. And so the challenges that that puts up for us, for workers that are working in small and medium-sized workplaces, for workers in the gig economy, particularly for insecure workers who face every day the fear of job loss and not knowing how much they're going to earn. And of course, for migrant workers and younger workers, just to name a few, we have to organise differently to reach these workers. And of course, the other thing that we know is that even then, even when our unionising density was higher, it still was the case that we were missing groups of workers. So in the time when we had 50% union membership, they were predominantly men. Mm. Uh, so it was a majority of male members of unions and there were still many women that we weren't mm. reaching in the union movement. We now see the opposite mm. in that the majority of union members in the country are women. And we've also seen that, I suppose, change in the type of workplaces and the type of relationship to work that people have. Uh, Michael, building power, what's that meant for you? Well, it is it is the critical question. I mean, our, we we all have a mission statement, don't we? And and uh, ours includes that we need to give uh, transport workers a powerful voice. That's actually our distilled mission statement. And I think one of the key things when we go to this first question of what we need to be able to to, to do better to enable working people to influence decisions is actually to allow those workers to re-educate us as unions. So we're always talking about how we need to educate workers and make sure they're prepared for the fight. And of course, we need to do that. I think that education for the modern economy is going to require a circle of education. We need to understand that oftentimes our institutions, our union institutions that have been so proudly built over many decades, we need to grow. We're always looking to where is it that we should draw inspiration from for our growth. And of course, the first place we 
should be looking is to what our workers currently think. And uh, a lot of times, all we would need to do is ask them because they are living the experience of the modern economy. So to give an example of that, in transport supply chains, uh, workers very quickly came to the conclusion after the introduction of enterprise bargaining that that system was not going to be very good for them because there was a, a quick move, a quick concentration of power at the top of road transport supply chains in a very few major clients that wanted the work done, whether they be major retailers or manufacturers. And of course, what that meant was that it was in the economic interests of those powerhouses to deliberately splinter the workforces and the companies below them so that they could pit them in competition with each other and so that they could extract more and more dollars from the supply chain. Our, our workers understood this very early. Our challenge now is to figure out how with those workers, to get those workers to look with us in a strategic way above their instant employer and figure out how it is that we're going to change the structures of our industry. At the moment, we're stuck with enterprise bargaining. So how do we overcome that? How do we reconsolidate our power in the context of the current system and make sure uh, that workers have control over that power? These are really critical questions that we've been grappling with. Nadine, in your area of the community and public sector, I think we've got to start with thinking about what a union is and at its simplest, a union is a group of workers who come together to have the power to change what they can't change alone. The union is not something separate from the workers, the union is the workers. And then you've got to actually think about what are the levers that you have. So if I take the example of what was a very large dispute with government in Commonwealth bargaining with the CPSU safeguard campaign where the Commonwealth government was seeking to freeze pay, cut conditions, cut rights, and for some workers actually cut their take-home pay. That was a massive whole of government campaign that involved significant industrial action and, you know, very gutsy from workers where they're facing very significant threats, particularly for workers in national security, at airports, in frontline roles. But importantly, it was also about doing the power analysis that said that what might influence government as a decision maker and employer wasn't just industrial action, it was about community pressure, it was about public perception of them. It was about having a media and communication strategy where we made friends with journalists, told them the stories of families, where we had workers who couldn't speak up and their kids did videos talking about the impact for them where service providers and people and organisations using public services became part of that campaign and the allies in it. And those things were incredibly important, particularly where the institutional and legal structures are not going to work for us, for any worker, for any union, let alone when you're taking on very large and powerful employers who can throw an endless amount of money and lawyers at anything that workers do. Tom, a, a reflection from, from you, you've seen the union movement change uh, in extraordinary ways over the decades. What do you see as, uh, as critical for unions to help their members and, and help their organisations influence what happens in society? I think we've, we have to inspire workers to understand what sort of a society the trade union movement seeks to create. In my opinion, we seek to create a society that is more cohesive, that is based on justice, equal opportunity, multiculturalism, fairness, expanded democracy, and a society that is sustainable. I think when we look at our history, we have taken Australia partly down this road, but there is still a long way to go. Yes, uh, absolutely. So it, what's come out of your, your comments from, from all of you is that importance of building membership, the importance of education so that the members have a good understanding and they're communicating clearly to their officials, th their views. And as Tom says, where unions inspire, they will, be, they will be so much more effective. I think for a lot of people, when they consider unions and union power, they might have a rather old-fashioned view that union power is expressed through industrial action and only really in industrial action. But how from the uh, guests today do you see unions as expressing and demonstrating their power? 
It's absolutely the case, Ed, and because there's many forms of industrial action that I've seen in my life as a unionist, and sometimes ones that may appear small can have great power. I remember a group of clothing workers in a factory where the boss was trying to take away their RDO and reduce their pay, and what they did was wear black armbands. But the fact that they, at the same moment on the same day, they all decided that this was the symbol of what was happening to them that they were all going to do was a, a simple thing, but a very powerful thing in terms of their collective power being exercised in a way. So I think industrial action, we've got to think broadly. But of course, the other forms of power for workers are community power, legal power and political power. And what I know from my time with textile clothing and footwear workers is for us to win change for those workers and particularly for the most exploited of those workers who are workers who worked at home as out workers we had to use every one of those levers over a long period of time so the notion that power is quickly won is I think rarely the case so finding ways where we both took industrial action but also built community alliances found people within the broader community whether it be in faith groups or student groups or other unions or other organisations, many migrant um, organisations who were prepared to stand with us against injustice and who saw what was happening to those workers as something that was unacceptable and when we're prepared to be part of a, of a campaign that was about struggling for the rights of those workers alongside them. So that sort of community power. In terms of political, uh, well, legal power, it was about a fight to say there was a fundamental flaw in the law that these workers weren't treated as workers, that they were made to take on all the risk themselves to establish basically what was sham company arrangements where they were told they had to pay their own super and look after their own workers' comp and basically as a, as a way of exploiting them in a in a form where they were uh, really trying to say all the risk is with the worker rather than the person at the top of the supply chain as Michael spoke before. So the change to the law that we won out of that campaign about linking the worker right through a supply chain to ultimately the brand or the company at the top and what needed to change in the law to bring effect to that cascading responsibility through supply chains was critical part of of that and of course the political campaign to win it successfully through the parliament to have to work with conservative governments and crossbenchers and independents to build enough of a force uh, to get the numbers to see that change come to life. Yeah, well, look, I think this is a really critical point about the form of power. I mean, if if I look back into, as I have done, I read some of the history of the TWU, I know that since the 1890s, trolleymen, draymen, carters, they were, were working 15-hour shifts, they were sleeping in their carriages. We've known, haven't we, that industrial action alone is not going to do the job for us. I mean, we suffered significant defeats after raising our voices there. And really, that should be totally unsurprising to us. And I think that as as people who are working and trying to organise uh, workers, it's that fundamental understanding that power and the discussion about power for workers really requires us to face up to a hard reality. And that is left untouched, our society through history has often meant and nearly always meant that power ends up with the haves, whether it's the political haves or the despot haves or the material haves, that's where power gravitates towards. In fact, you could almost say mm. that is the natural state of power. And our job is to figure out as organised labour how it is that we not only exercise moments of power, but how we embed a sustenance of that power over time. Because our struggle is really about not just building power, but figuring out how to ensure that it doesn't do what it naturally does, and that is dissipate very, very quickly. And that's why uh, early on we decided after those massive strikes that we were going to have to build ourselves into the political system. We were going to have to do that because otherwise how were we going to ensure that we were going to be able to sustain the power that we had won? And so that's what becomes very hard, Ed, when, when you fight in that way 
you get something up like the, the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal. Why do you get it up? Well, you get it up to, to assist workers, of course, but you get it up fundamentally to fight against the ordinary dissipation of power. Look, ebb away from workers of power. You put an institution in place to ensure that you can continue to exercise power. And I think this is it's an iterative process. We exercise moments of power, but if we just do it for a moment in time, it's a waste and it will revert to its natural state. So our, our battle is how do we sustain power? Ed, I, I think our role is to lift the political consciousness of the workers. We need to explain to them, using history, that militant unionism alone cannot achieve major reforms or victories. But without militant unionism, we can't win any decisive battles. So I think they, workers need to understand that strategical unionism has been the key to our victories. Strategical unionism involves planning and the execution of, of tactics that are militant. But it also includes the need to engage in political forms of struggle, such as building people's power. And we've got a lot of examples to prove it. For example, we defeated work choices through, through people's power, the ballot box, the powerful women's movement in the 70s, and the union movement cooperated together to increase women's wages. People need to understand, we need to explain our politics through stories based on our history. Tom, I'm, I'm going to switch the discussion to the way that the Australian trade union movement has built such a, a really an extraordinary, a broad-based industrial and social safety net. From your point of view, what's been so critical? What, what have been the main factors in Australia's success in, in building a, a social safety net that uh, in many ways leads many countries around the world? Our safety net of entitlements was won over a period of 60 years of struggle. Behind each of these struggles is a story about how workers made great sacrifices and showed great courage and determination in the struggle over decades. The building workers went on strike for five weeks throughout New South Wales and won full compensation pay. And I want to show that struggle for full workers' compensation pay involved the, the use of a whole range of tactics. It was not just uh, the strike that won it. It was the tactics we used to isolate our enemies and maximise our power. I went down to a meeting at the Opera House. There was 200 building workers there. Three of their workmates were seriously injured off work for about six months. So they demanded that those three workers be paid full pay for the time they would off injured. When the employer refused, they went on strike. We then went to the other CBD jobs and put the same proposition. The employers refused, so they went on strike. And when, they, when all the CBD jobs had shut down, those workers called on us to one out, all out. So the whole building industry in New South Wales was on strike. We used history and it t told us what the arguments of the employers would be. The demand for full workers' compensation pay would mean that thousands and tens of thousands of jobs would be lost and the world would come to an end. Well, we counted it by getting an insurance company to price what was the cost of paying workers in additional week, half pay on compo, accident pay, and when you put the two together, they got full pay. Insurance company said $1 per week, one worker. When the bosses put up the attitude, I feel I'm at the meeting. When the bosses put, it, put up that argument, we killed them. We said, this dispute could be solved by you employers by $1 per worker, per week. And then... Well, we had a strike meeting at Wentworth Park. We marched up to the master builders up City Road. We were led by two rows of workers in wheelchairs and dressed up as they were injured. This was done by the nurses at the Sydney uh, Hospital because we'd put a ban on that to stop it being demolished. So they owed us a favour. When we got there, there was police everywhere. 
the front doors were locked and the workers rang gear and some of the workers says, let's smash down the doors and take over the place. We had anticipated based on our lessons of history. So our marshal says to them, you silly bastards, we don't want the cameras of the media focusing on broken doors. We want them focusing on injured workers. They got the message. We got great publicity. And soon after, the strike was won. And then workers in the power of, of, of equality, the w building workers in all the other states wanted it. When they got it, then the metal workers wanted it, and everyone wanted it. And then finally, over time, it was universal throughout Australia. So when I'm talking to workers, I just say, and we beat the <laughs> bastards. So that's a, a, a nice example of, uh, of workers' power being very effective and winning good gains. Warning, this includes a story involving workplace fatality and suicide. Michael, can you give us some, some examples here? Actually, brilliant to hear that. Brilliant to hear it, uh, and from Tom as well. Look, the thing is that moving into, the, into where we are at the moment, exercising power through strike action is something that strong unions do across, uh, across the movement, but it's become increasingly difficult within our system. And so we've had, to, we've had to figure out other ways to be able to strike at the heart of those economic behemoths to get them to act in a way that's in the interest of workers and to get workers to understand that really their focus uh, needs to be on that. So, of course, uh, the best example I have, uh, we borrowed heavily from Michelle's old union, the Textile, Clothing and Footwear Union, who Michelle's described really unpicked power relationships through the supply chains that ended up exploiting out workers uh, right across the world, but in Australia particularly is was the example that we used. And so we realised, of course, that that was a very similar example in the road transport sector uh, where you threw a through systemic issues such as enterprise bargaining but mm. just because of the power dynamics you have very large road transport clients customers who are purchasing transport services and thousands of companies beneath them who are competing for that work and the question was well how can we build a campaign that will engage all of those workers across all of those companies, when of course they're in completely different places and, and, and have different employers, bargaining for 1,000 or 2,000 enterprise arrangements is not a very efficient way to do business. And of course, the problem is that once you've organised one company, uh, those clients, those customers who are using the transport operators will just go around them to get cheaper outcomes for their supply chain. So the question really became, well, how do we strike at the heart of that model? Uh, how do we strike at the heart of those economic behemoths, the heart of their power. And uh, so we exercised power and thought about power in a couple of ways. First of all, we realised in the same way that Tom's uh, relayed to us the power of those injured workers, we of course realised that in Australia, unfortunately, terribly unfortunately, over 200 Australians each year lose their lives in truck crashes. That's horrendous. That is, uh, that is slaughter. And around 60 or 70 of those are the truck drivers themselves, but the remainder are the Australian public. And that's a very powerful message. And if you just bear with me for a second, Ed, I'll, I'll, I'll relay the story that brings that all together that will always stay with me. And that's the story that I was told by Lystra Taglia Ferry, a, a mother of two you know, out in Western Australia. And she told me about the night that her husband, David, didn't come home. She said that she tried to put the kids to bed, that they wouldn't go to sleep. She later told me that she thought that was because of transferred anxiety. And she was anxious because she phoned David's mobile two or three times. He was a nurse at the local hospital. And that anxiety really cascaded into terror when she phoned the hospital and they confirmed that he had left at the appointed time. And this is a horrific story. 23 hours earlier, truck driver Paul Kershaw had started work and about 11 hours into his shift, he got a call from his boss and his boss said, Paul, I'm going to need you to come back to the yard, but then I'll need you to go out again. And Paul said, well, how can I do that? I'm dog tired. I've been working six days this week. I can't do it. And his boss said, well, you either do it or you don't have a job and you won't have a job because we won't have the contract with the major retailer. They had a contract to can't meet. So much against his better judgment, he goes out and he does the work. Now, David had actually stopped on the side of the road because he had a flat tire and a good Samaritan 
Jackson, Albert de Beer, stopped to help him. He was 42. He had two children himself. Neither of these are truck drivers. Now, of course, we don't know precisely and we'll never know what happened when David and Albert saw the headlights coming down the road. Uh, but Paul Kershaw, in his semi-trailer, fell asleep and ran over the top of both of them and killed them outright. And then, of course, Lystra relays to us the horror of answering the knock at the door, you know, the knock that no Australian should have, ever have to answer, a knock that comes from the corporate greed of that retailer at the top of the supply chain that has squeezed the company so hard that that worker had to work 23 hours and resulted in this loss of life and these workers, uh, these families being uh, irretrievably broken. That story encapsulates the dynamics of the industry, the terror that everyone faces when their children are not coming home, when their spouses are not coming home on the roads, and the sheer danger, deadly danger of our industry. And so through that power, that is power in and of itself. That narrative is power in and of itself. And that power finally moved in a minority Gillard government, a minority Gillard government, the Parliament of Australia to put in place the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal, which had the power to make binding orders on those clients that ended up killing Paul Kershaw. And the very shocking coda to that story is that Paul served four of his five years in jail for that. The transport company, there were no repercussions. The client, there were no repercussions. And just last September, we had the dreadful news that Paul Kershaw had taken his own life. This is what we face. That terrible story, though, is a source of power in and of itself. It moved minority federal parliamentarians to agree to put that tribunal in place. And that tribunal in and of itself was very powerful. And perhaps I can speak about that in relation to another question. Michael, that's a powerful and very moving story. Thank you for sharing it with us. Tom, I think you want to share a story that illustrates a great moment in our history when the labour movement forged epic change through a powerful combination of vision, strategy, struggle and solidarity. Superannuation. We can use it to explain how the working class can win. In 1983, half a dozen ACTU leaders got in a room and decided that the union movement should campaign for industry-based superannuation. It was an idea. So that the power of that idea takes us to where we are today. Six million workers in industry superannuation, the assets of it in workers' capital. It means that workers own a lot of Australia. They own buildings. They now infrastructure, a partly owned airports. Who ever thought that we would be able to get a bit of socialism, that is workers' ownership, into a capitalist system? But we bloody well did, because we got to explain the unions are not unions without the power of the rank and file of the workers, and they need to be in their unions if they want to protect things like super and if they want to build a better future for their family. So we got to explain the big picture too. The establishment want workers to be only concerned about an enterprise agreement, getting a few dollars in a wage increase that is eaten away by inflation over time, and you start again. When you get these conditions uh, like the safety net and superannuation, they are permanent. The bloody establishment can't take it away from them because they own it. And when they've tried to, they've lost government. So that's the message we got to get the workers. we got to get the workers to understand that they created these entitlements through struggle, unity, solidarity. And uh, I'm getting a bit excited. I better shut up. <laughs> it's worth getting excited about this. <laughs> Nadine, your reflections, please. I think Tom is absolutely right about the power and importance of telling our stories, but it's also about framing those in a way that gives people hope and brings it to life. And I'll give you an example that became something very big, which is back in 2014 after the budget, there's this rather unsexy thing that 
CPSU discovered and there was a little ad in the financial review, something about Medicare and, you know, some sort of system, some request for tender. That was what became, hang on a sec, government is looking at outsourcing Medicare payments. That's a key element of the whole plank of the system. And I remember right at the beginning of that, and we're actually, there was a few of us who were sitting in my office and, and someone said, you'll never make outsourcing Medicare payments anything sexy. I mean, no one's ever going to be interested in this issue. Well, two years later, there was a lot of interest in the election. But it was that thing about actually finding the story of what do our members in Medicare do? It is actually really important to get that money to working people. People rely on it. They can't afford to go to the doctor otherwise. This is a profound difference between Australia and America where they're charging for a COVID-19 test and then, of course, you can't afford the health care that goes with it anyway. But here, when your kids get sick, you can take them to a doctor and you can take them to a hospital if you need to. And that became something of building a whole community alliance of all these groups and organisations that cared about Medicare, including the Country Women's Association. We had lovely young women activists, they tended to wear frocks for it, who actually went round to all the CWA meetings. You know, we never thought of CWA as an ally. We sort of things that are important to union members are just often what's important to people in the community. But we've got to turn that into something that comes to life and then we've got to organise around it and we can we can make change. And, of course, those thousands of workers in Medicare, they still have those jobs and that's really precious. Michelle, over to you. What I know is that power is never something that is given by us asking nicely for it. It's uh, it's interesting because I think that it's both about what Nadine's talking about, which is the sort of building of broad understanding and coalitions, but it's also about having workers at the forefront, the rank and file there. You know, we've heard Michael describe this and Tom as well, of mm. course, that the powerful impact of workers themselves telling their own story and describing their own lives in a way that disrupts the narrative and disrupts the demonising of collective power and union. The other thing I'd say, Ed, is that if you think of the story about equal pay and and everything that happened over decades and decades of the campaign to win equal pay in this country, again, you've got that combination of different forms of power being exercised and surprising people. So you both have industrial action where workers go on strike and, and struggle to win equal pay through that you have women chaining themselves to the outside of the Fair Work, com- what's now the Fair Work Commission and the government offices. So, you know, powerful symbolic ways of bringing the story to life. But you also have workers coming together and protesting by dancing, you know. So it's a surprising, it's collective action, but it's surprising collective action that captures imagination, inspires people in the way that Tom started us off with Mm. today. And it's that combination of the hard political campaigning, the smart and strategic industrial action, and the building of strong broad and deep community alliances where we have people who are going to stand with us and fight with us. This has been a discussion, an enjoyable discussion, a great discussion about uh, a number of things, but power being one of them. And I've spoken a little bit uh, in my responses today about the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal. And that tribunal was really remarkable in the sense that cutting across the grain, it had it had the power to investigate supply chains, to put in place binding orders, to put in place rates and conditions for independent contractors, and to bind everyone right up and down the supply chain. Now, the interesting thing about the RSRT was it never really got to do its work. It existed for about three or four years, and it got, was on the cusp of making four or five really important important orders across the road transport industry. I'll come to its downfall shortly. But the important point I wanted to make on this power discussion is one about unsprung power. That is, the potential exercise of power is often just as effective as the exercise of power itself. And during that life of the RSRT, what we extracted from the RSRT in the most powerful way 
were agreements that were struck outside of the RSRT because of the existence of the RSRT. So, for example, Coles mm. and Woolworths, to a lesser degree, that we'd been fighting with for 15 years, exposing the consequences of the commercial pressures that they placed on supply chains. Because they faced the spectre of having binding orders made on their supply chains in a manner that may well not have suited their commercial model, they came to us and they sat down with us and agreed with a set of processes that suited their model. So it, it was that potential exercise of power. It's like the old philosophers, like the Foucault discussion of power or Jeremy Bentham and the panopticon where you've got prison set up and you've got one prison guard that may or may not be observing you at any point in time and that's enough to keep you in your place. These are very powerful institutions. Our institutions that we build when we exercise worker power from all of the struggles that Tom, Michelle and Nadine have spoken about and put them in place. It's no wonder the power of capital wants to pull them down because it's that constant threat that has the effect of rebalancing the scales in our favour, whether or not those institutions are being used at a particular moment. That is power for us. And our workers and the people that we represent, they get that. They absolutely get it. And if we can, as Tom said, inspire them to fight for those bigger pictures that allow, allow us to rebalance our society on an ongoing basis, that's very powerful itself. So unsprung mm. power is just as important as power exercised. Can you share with us, I'll just ask each of you to share with us, what you think is a really important takeaway for the activists who are listening to this podcast. Nadine, can I begin with you? I always think of Alice Walker's quote, the most common way we give up power, people give up power is by believing they don't have any. Power is not fixed how much power you have and exercise depends on the exercise of your collective creativity, the analysis you bring to it. The other side, capital, employers, governments will often make you think that you have no power or very little power. They're lying. So you have to explore creatively what is the power that we have together so we can make change. Thank you, Tom. There are two agendas right now. There is the agenda of the ACTU, which we've got to get workers to fight for. And there's the agenda of coalition governments and big business. And they want to deregulate the labour market. They want to destroy militant unionism. They want to destroy the institutions which exist to protect the safety net. They want to destroy the relationship between the trade union movement and labor governments. They want to destroy everything where it involves power. They want workers to be on individual contracts. And so workers have to understand if they don't fight for the ACTU agenda, they will finish up with the employing class agenda by default. So we have to use the situation in America to show that it's not just a matter of creating greater wealth leads to greater prosperity for the working class because the bloody opposite has happened in America. The richest country in the world has got the worst health system in the world, the worst minimum wage system in the world, the worst safety net in the world, and workers don't fall for the argument that if they sit back and cop a bad deal, somewhere out in the future, when we increase productivity, it'll be all a rose and honey. It won't be. And their safety net is there, is the foundation of their quality mm. of life. So they have to defend the safety net. We have to fight to protect every form of power. We have to fight to protect militant unionism. And if we don't, we'll finish up like America and ask workers, do they want what's in America or do they want what is in Australia? And if they want what is in Australia, they've got to fight for it. Michelle, would you like to provide us with something for our activists? Yeah, thanks, Ed, and thanks so much listening to Tom and, and Michael and Nadine there. It, it's it's an inspiring conversation. I suppose I'd say that, you know, just building on Tom's last point, that we should 
not underestimate the forces that are amassed against us and who are plotting and planning every day to wrestle back the power that we have won and the things we've created for working people in this country and around the world. So we should never underestimate that. We should also, I think, be very vigilant about it, but strategic and organised in our response. We can't be haphazard. We can't sit back and think it'll all be all right because it won't. So being planned, strategic and unified in what we do is so critically important. I think I'd say to people that never be afraid to defy the powerful, never be afraid to do that, and that really that the power of collective defiance changes lives and that's what we can do. Yeah, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to borrow from Michelle here and note that the real starting point is, is what Michelle has said, that power concedes nothing without a demand. And Tom and Nadine and Michelle have gone through the ways we have demanded change. And it's, it's that very famous saying that I think was coined by the, uh, the founder of the Salvos here. It says, if we, if we want to make the future a better place, then we have to disturb the present. And disturbing the present means we've got to find a way to exercise power to disturb the present. But we've got to understand that the demand that we make must be one that has the effect of sustaining that change in the balance of power. And I think if workers can see that their fight leads them to sustainable change, then they are more willing to pick up arms and go hell for leather. Workers, we know, all of us know, they do actually naturally want to get together and change things. And if we can give them that vision that that change agenda is one that's going to give them power on a sustainable basis, they come with you. They go. Friends, I'd like to thank Tom and our three guests, Michelle O'Neill, Michael Kane and Nadine Flood. This podcast has certainly underlined how important it is that activists have a comprehensive understanding of the nature of power and how it can be deployed to best effect. As this podcast has demonstrated, history has been changed through building power and there's power in drawing upon the lessons of history. And now a song to close by Chloe and Jason Roweth. They're drawing from their extensive repertoire of traditional and contemporary songs to bring you a powerful example of music used in support of progressive change. Over to you. Thanks, Ed. We'd like to do a song called The Green Band Fusiliers, written by Dennis Kevins back in the 70s. When activism for change, or in this case, to stop change and development, is based on shared values, it can bring together some unlikely alliances. That is exactly what happened in this case. The Green Band's movement of the 70s united the builders' unions with environmental organisations and local resident action groups. And where the local community strongly supported an action, the Green Bands defended open spaces and older buildings from high-rise and freeway development. As Dennis says in his song, they saved a bit of Sydney for you. Uh, He wrote this song and the short poem in 72. At that time, he was a builders' labourer in Sydney and a member of the BLF. Now, Dennis was one of those blokes who knew the tunes that put a bit of steel in your spine, you know, those ones that are far too good for just one set of words. And he knew this spirited old Irish traditional tune. The tune had been used by Dominic Behan just 10 years before in the early 60s. And he turned it into a song called McAlpine's Fusiliers, which was a song just about the Irish builders' labourers in London. Dennis made it into a song of protest. And instead of their shovels on their shoulders, Dennis had them with their placards high above their ears. Yes, saving a bit of Sydney. Here's Dennis Kevin's song, The Green Band Fusiliers. You doze it down the churches, laid them level with the street, the sacristy and altar trodden on by passing feet. He didn't talk of sacrilege We're knocking churches down But we yelled It's a sacrilege To smash old Sydney town Up oh, Broadway to the MBA Come the Green Band Fusiliers They stole the street With their marching feet Black hearts high above their ears in Sydney town and they would not lie down They gave mutton scabs some cheer And it's up Broadway to the MBA Come the Green Band Fusiliers Half smart thieves with their 
Taguchi sleeps and car parks on the brain. Told the usual lie, the trees have got to die, the fig trees in Sydney's domain. And some said, Joe, oh, we, we ought to let them go. It's, it's only, only bloody timber, timber to be cleared. Ah, but listen to the trees as they whisper to the breeze and the green back fusiliers. Bulldozer blades made of lightning gray, coming in with a great big rush. Moving in for the kill up at Hunter's Hill at beautiful Kelly's Bush. But the local women lay down in the bulldozer's way to the bucking and the shuddering of the gears. And when their hands were raised, the ones they praised were the green band fusiliers. Oh, up Broadway to the MBA come the green band fusiliers. They stole the street with their marching feet. Placards high above their ears In Sydney town And they would not lie down They gave Martin Scaff some cheer And it's up Broadway to the MBA Come the Green Band Fusiliers They made a stand for our sunny land At the rocks and the Wollamaloo On the chimney tops they waltzed with the cops To save a bit of Sydney for you And the finance police who made refugees Of families who had been pioneers Finished on their ass and they did their brass With the green band fusiliers Through the years and through my tears I can see them marching again from the dizzy heights and the concrete sites In sunshine and in rain That patch of green is getting a lovely old sheen No matter how many flow the years And it's up Broadway to the MBA Come the Green Band Fusiliers Oh, up Broadway to the MBA Come the Green Band Fusiliers they stole the street with their marching feet, placards high above their ears. In Sydney town, they would not lie down, they gave Martin Scab some cheer. And it's up Broadway to the MBA, now the Green Band Fusiliers. This masterclass series has been produced by Deliberately Engaging in support of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals to build the institutions of civil society and empower people with a greater voice. The support of the Committee to Defend Trade Union Rights and of Tony and Nina Bleasdale is gratefully acknowledged. I hope you'll join us on the next episode of this masterclass series for empowering activists. I'm Ed Davis. Bye for now.